All right, we're almost at the 10.45 mark. Um, I'm not going to be doing an introduction. I'll just let you all just introduce everything. Seems like everyone's audio and visual is working, and we have the slides up, so it looks like we're good to go technically, but I'll be here in case anything goes around. All right, thanks. I'm just going to call it. What are your interests for this session? That's great. Thanks. And I've got some other text in there that I'll read as we go to that, but Oh, so it shows up now. Interesting. I think you can hide it, but I guess I don't see a way to do that, but we can just point people to it at that point. Because I think if they don't click on it, they're not going to see it. So. I don't know how much time we should give people to get in. <laughs> um, Maybe just a minute more. All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, it looks like we might have a few people still coming in, but we don't want to uh, not leave ourselves time for question and answer at the end. So welcome to our presentation of As You Build It, They Will Come, How a Journal Club Prepares for Innovation or an Innovation Lab. Um, Hale Library on the K-State campus, after recovering from a fire three years ago, will be home to the Sunderland Foundation Innovation Lab. And as we get started, we have a couple of questions just to help get to know our audience. So if you've ever been in a journal club, what was the topic? And if you could just post that in the chat, we would appreciate that. That'll help kind of direct our uh, presentation this morning. Okay, so it looks like not a lot of people have been involved in a journal club. I hadn't heard of it either until we did this here. So um, hopefully we can share something new and, and spread the wonderful thing that this has become. So our Innovation Journal Club has given us an opportunity to have important questions about inclusion, belonging, copyright, digital scholarship, assessment, programming, and outreach with future champions of the lab. We'd like to know if you've come to this session because you're interested in um, or want to learn more about what a journal club is or what or this specific journal club or what is the effect of the journal club on an innovation lab or both. So if you would click over to the poll and answer that question for us, that would be very helpful. Thank you. We'll give people just a couple minutes to do that. Is everyone able to see the poll? Thanks, Corey. Thanks, Corey.
Thank you, Matt. All right, Carol, can we go to the next slide then? Yeah, I kind of wanted to see the poll results, but I'm not okay. sure. <laughs> you have to vote to be able to see the results. Oh, okay. Got it. Or I can show those in a little <laughs> bit. Okay, so it looks like um, the interests, I don't know, I guess everyone can, can find the results if they've responded. Sorry, next slide. Gotcha, Renee. <laughs> <laughs> So just kind of a general uh, timeline of how the lab got started. Um, in February of 2018, we had a group of people from campus IT and the library start working on an innovation lab plan based on a donation. In May of 2018, we had a fire and that shut down the entire library for now three years. So from 18 through 2020, we have been working with architects, making decisions about technology, um, along with the entire li library renovation. We've had, we've involved librarian and instructional designers in our planning committee starting in February of 19. Um, in November of 19, we added new committee leadership and expanded responsibilities. And in July of 2020, we had our first journal club meeting. If you would like to learn more about the lab itself um, or the partnership with IT and the library, the division of IT has been very um, instrumental in this process and the collaboration has been fabulous. So if you'd like to learn more about that, please join Jeff and Carol and I with a group from the division of IT tomorrow at nine o'clock in the morning for Making the Makerspace, how we created the Sunderland, Innovation, Sunderland Foundation Innovation Lab. And then actually a couple of dates that we don't have on there are our soft opening, which just happened a month ago. And then our um, anticipated grand opening, which will be in September of this year. Thanks, Carol. So our up to this point, you know, the, in the time that Renee just mentioned and on the timeline, our formal organization has been focused primarily on getting equipment and operations up and running. Uh, we have we have a steering committee comprised of our library administration, our, and that includes our dean and associate deans. Also included in the um, are the coordinate, excuse me, coordinating committee or planning committee, uh, the co-chairs that belong to that committee, the uh, technology directors for the library and central division of IT, um, and uh, the coordinate, co coordinating committee itself. Um, it's a committee that's about a 50-50 mixture of employees between the K-State Libraries and Division of IT groups. Uh, and at this point includes our academic services representatives. The hardware and software subcommittee is tasked uh, specifically with determining, evaluating, and acquiring hardware and software needs for the innovation lab to operate. And the programming committee is composed of our academic services faculty and IT. So it took a little while to get there uh, and get those academic services uh, uh, employees uh, present. Um, the programming committee has um, uh, the program committee has some opportunities for making connections across campus, but the focus has been really on figuring out how the space will be promoted and used, what types of programs will offer, how different members of the campus uh, community will be involved in programming, assessment, promotion of workshops and events, and how to develop, curate, and present training resources for staff and users. Um, so again, if you're curious about our organization and would like more information on that planning process, please come to our panel discussion tomorrow at 9 a.m. So for the past three years, the planning committee has been aware that uh, if you build it, they will come phrase. You know, it's not a given, especially with our emphasis on the they of they will come, uh, especially when that emphasis is focused on campus communities uh, underserved by technology and people who might not have much experience with the kinds of technology we'll, uh, we'll have in this space. So being focused on making decisions about what's in the space and uh, how, it, how it will work leaves little time or energy to connect with uh, future users, let alone study what makes, what makes similar spaces successful. So the planning committee uh, it's also heavily IT biased, I, I, that's my word, um, 
And what we're making isn't just a computer lab. We can't just uh, be focused on the troubleshooting, the warranties and the maintenance. We need the experience of those who understand the different communities uh, that we want to serve and to learn from the experience about what methods of engagement work. So the Innovation Journal Club is our solution to what's missing. By working with the academic services librarians and learning about what other journal clubs do, as well as from other experts on our campus and beyond, uh, we can bring that into the planning process. Next slide, please. So our academic services department wasn't directly involved in the initial planning process. I, I made some comments about that. Uh, however, one of the department's, libra uh, department's librarians and uh, one of the instructional designers uh, did join our coordinating committee. And you know we had challenges communicating how this space could be relevant to our academic services department as a whole, um, given that the department and the library was understaffed. So taking on something new and we were still trying to do everything we were doing uh, was a big, uh, kind of a big ask. Uh, we'd also been through consecutive years of getting feedback from faculty across campus on major journal cancellations um, and getting faculty excited about the expenses between these cancellations was uh, complicated and relied uh, on learning how to very clearly communicate our intentions to the faculty across the university. Um, I would say that a good deal of faculty um, really couldn't quite make heads or tails about where the money might be coming from for this big space when we were doing all these cancellations. That was a very, very good deal. So next slide, please. So our existing formal organization also didn't allow for or necessarily even encourage communication with non-committee members. And of course, we know that when we open our doors uh, without communicating, the the community won't feel like this is their space if they don't know it uh, know it exists or haven't been involved in planning it. So having a journal club has given us an opportunity to keep a larger group in the loop uh, in the loop on what's happening with the planning process, as well as incorporate the experience of others into that planning. And I think this slide does a good job of showing uh, just how much perspective, insight, and experience the Innovation Journal Club opens up to the coordinating committee with its planning efforts. And Carol, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Okay, I minimized my Chrome window and now it won't come back. So I was gonna do a screen share on how it works, but I can just talk us through it. We're actually using um, Teams, Microsoft Teams to communicate between meetings and to host our meetings. Um, members volunteer or they're invited or encouraged or voluntold to select an article um, of their interest. And then we have, um, those asynchronous discussions on our teams, we have a different channel for each meeting. So we meet once a month for an hour and a half, but we try to get our ideas on the channel in between meetings in case people can't come to the meeting. Um, our first meeting was actually an interesting discussion on the benefits of a journal club since most of us had never done that before. So we read an article um, that I can share in the chat once I stop screen sharing <laughs> later. Um, it was all about librarians, but um, would in getting professional development out of a journal club. And so we don't just read journal articles. Um, we found an incredible conference called the International Symposium of Academic Makerspaces that has lots of different conference proceedings. They have posters and papers. Um, all of their things are open. Uh, they've been going since 2016, I think. And then we found this um, book that was published last year called Remaking the Library Makerspace, which has some excellent chapters on diversity in makerspaces. Um, we've done a makerspace tour, which was really fun. So instead of reading an article that month, we went and looked at different websites, found um, things that we wanted to, I mean, we were in COVID times, we couldn't really travel. So we went on virtual tours of those um, spaces and watched their videos and looked at how they lay out, how they communicate what their space is. And then we've had a couple of guests in our journal club. So recently we had the Michigan State University Digital Scholarship Lab, which um, Emily will talk about in a minute, but we also had faculty from our own university who have much more experience with virtual reality in agriculture education and communication join us for one of our meetings. So we read an article about VR and ag education that week, but we also had guests. So that's sometimes we, we mix it up. 
So I don't know if if journal club purists would call us a journal club because we're just a, a community, a learning community that that uses journal articles sometimes. But um, I think it's been really effective and and maybe more engaging than just reading articles, although the articles are really interesting. And we've learned a lot about how people study and research and what kind of data they collect when they're doing research on spaces like the ones the one we have. I made this slide for Emily, but I don't know if she knows it exists. So um, <laughs> I will continue. So we connect with experts. I talked a little bit about connecting with experts in our own campus. We've connected with experts um, in our own department and um, connected with experts who have authored articles that, that we are reading. So that's another way that we connect. And now, go for it, Emily. <laughs> Sorry about that. Hi. Um, so I am Emily Finch. I'm the Scholar of Communication and Copyright Librarian in the Center for the Advancement of Digital Scholarship, which is a fancy way of saying a sub-department of academic services. Um, and I was incredibly interested when the Journal Club kicked off in finding ways uh, to become a member and engage for a number of reasons. Um, first and foremost, probably uh, the big Georgia State case on fair use and copyright, um, and kind of the idea in my head and a lot of the legal side literature, which was um, is a poster saying don't infringe on a printer enough? And does that apply to 3D printing um, and all the other great tools we have in the makerspace? Um, and so um, when Carol reached out and asked if I had anything to talk about, the answer was yes. The beautiful irony being that we both had found the same article um, because there's not a lot written um, on intellectual property in makerspaces um, from a library perspective and from an assessment perspective. Um, there's a ton of very pedantic law journal articles, um, but that wasn't going to help us uh, create a conversation and, and get the best use out of our space. Um, like a good scholarly communication librarian, I will go ahead and provide the citation information for the article we read. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to talk a moment to say about how I kind of took the structure that Carol just presented and kind of brought it to life um, related to the issue of intellectual property in these spaces. Um, so I went to the literature, um, and the beauty of that too is I think it helps you set up um, different assessment goals. Um, so on my end, the opportunity to partner with this space means what assessment can I do on our intellectual property needs and successes within our makerspace moving forward um, to contribute to this literature. Um, the idea of a new lab and new opportunities was really great. Um, then we, you know, we read and asked questions. Um, and these asking, reading and asking was like general ideas, what questions are out there um, from other academic service librarians that they can um, come up with it that they feel that their departments may ask, um, questions we had about what we had in terms of policy and assessment that mimicked what was brought up in the article. Um, and then just a, a great conversation of, of law and ethics as it pertains to these spaces um, outside of just me and my colleague in my department's brain on copyright. Um, and then we discussed it um, and, and what we looked at was distilling kind of meaningful discussion and how we can not just discuss the article within this group, but champion further discussion on the topics using the Innovation Lab as a space, um, but also with partners that'll sure up any risks within the space. Um, and then it was developing um, a plan, which is a, was a great opportunity as an academic service librarian to um, really benefit from the space in terms of getting to know my colleagues, getting to know the space, um, getting to learn the project, um, but also what I can do to ensure the success of the space. Um, so kind of using the scope of my expertise um, outside of my office and my traditional reference work um, and how it can benefit the library um, more broadly. Um, and this was actually a really great way for me to get involved and meet the team here, um, which is how I got involved in the programming committee. Um, and Carol, if you go to the next slide. Um, the other thing um, that came out of this meeting was uh, an invitation from Jeff to attend a meeting with Michigan State um, and get to know their team a little bit better. Um, who I had known briefly as a native Michigander and uh, as someone whose closest colleague is actually one of their digital scholarship librarians, um, but was welcome to the programming committee. Um, and Carol suggested why not reach out. Um, I'm only a year into K-State. I worked there two weeks in person. So in terms of really great scholarly communication, copyright issue, campus partnerships uh, that I could bring to the, the lab space, there were, there were very few none. Um, but where my campus partners were limited, um, my involvement outside of that space and in kind of an intellectual property community, there was a lot to be said and a lot of potential for um, future discussions. 
Um, and through that lens, we were able to work with the Michigan State Digital Scholarship Lab, um, a fellow land-grant institution, um, one we fight contentiously for the first land-grant institution title, um, and uh, to communicate with them and learn more about their lab. And so this wasn't a traditional um, journal lab. Um, and I made a citation for it, although it's, it's you know, a little annotated bibliography for it, it's not traditional. Um, but the, the beauty of this, I think, is that I think it gave a different lens to assessment that was, I think, at least for me, incredibly vital. Um, to hear another institution who does have a space put together, does have great faculty and student buy-in and has churned out quite a bit. They, they frequently launch digital humanities symposiums outside of their offices, um, was a great opportunity. And I think it is just, um, telling if you look at the two photos provided, um, the similarity of the space, the similarity in the look, there's a lot of congruency there. Um, and so the use of the journal club um, in a kind of non-traditional way um, to, to celebrate this partnership, get to talk and get to ask these questions of other experts in the area who are doing things like fa recruiting faculty, um, creating grants um, and bringing people into the space um, was beneficial. And uh, I think for me, it was important to consider it's not just the written word, um, but extending this this building of the space outside of our perspective and us getting bogged down in the administrative work that needs to be done um, to see how we can use our networks um, to help answer some of those questions. Thanks, Emily. So like Jeff mentioned earlier, um, the academic services department was not involved in the original planning and was really hesitant to become involved because of the optics of how are we going to tell people we cut all their favorite things when we're building this giant new shiny lab that no one really wants. Um, the no one really wants part is not true at all. People don't know what it is. So one of the major parts for us as a department was to learn more about it. And so I think the impact on our department has of having a journal club has given us a a pretty low barrier opportunity to learn about what the space will be like. So we didn't have to become tech experts. We could learn by what we do. We do research. So we help others do research. We know how to find information. So we went looking for, for information about how spaces like this operate and how they work and, and started reading and getting to know what some of the best practices are. And so we've also gotten more librarians involved in the planning process. So men, Emily mentioned that she joined the programming committee. So that's in the formal organizational structure of how this um, project is getting launched. But um, another librarian, Ellen Erton, also joined that committee. And she joined from the perspective of, I have no idea what this is. And so it's really good to have people with different perspectives on committees like that. When the whole thing started, everyone was either from our division of IT, which is the campus level IT department or IT unit and from the library's IT. And so there wasn't really a, a person in the room who didn't know technology or didn't feel comfortable around technology. So it's been really great to have more involvement from a more diverse um, perspective in the planning process. And then we've also um, been making the space physical before it comes. So some of us in our department um, had never seen a space like that and didn't have any idea what that would mean. And that's a pretty big thing to imagine if you've never heard of it before, if you don't know what VR is, if you don't, I mean, you've walked by a 3D printer, but not actually printed anything or touched anything that came out of it. So there's a lot of um, uh, thought experience club and to but actually seeing how other people spaces or how they advertise their spaces. Um, and then we've increased the understanding of emerging technology and how it could be used by different departments across campus. So everyone in, well, there are most of the librarians in the academic services department serve departments across campus. So making those connections, um, the slide that, that Jeff, that we were looking at when Jeff was talking where it had what, what academic services connections are, they're connected across campus, they're connected to community organizations and groups, and they're um, also connected to professional organizations. So we, we are in our professional organizations at a national or international level, and we're able to be more curious about the sessions that are about makerspaces because it is a, a trend in libraries. Um, or about innovation or about emerging technologies, even though that's not where our profession as academic services or research and instruction librarians traditionally lies. 
great to have like a onboarding or some buy-in from a department that actually lives in the library where this space will also be and, and can help promote it and, and help connect users to the space. And so the, the kinds of conversations to talk about how we can get those people who are underserved by technology or people who are uncomfortable with technology, people who would just walk by a space like that and think that's not for me, how we can get them in the door. And so that's where, um, where, we're, where we're at right now. Thank you. So the impact on the Innovation Lab. Well, before opening, uh, we simply didn't have the experience available to us for interfacing with the community, uh, for understanding our demographics, or even knowing what our options might be. Uh, the Innovation Journal Club brought that into the conversation. We've talked with other site institutions, other groups who have succeeded in areas where we had yet to explore. We looked at policy and legal concerns and delved into assessment. Um, we simply couldn't get into all these topics at any deep level when everyone in our programming subcommittee had other duties to attend to in the Innovation Lab of Reality. So Innovation Journal Club allowed those who are most deeply interested in the development of the Innovation Lab uh, the choice to kind of cordon off some time to get together to, to, to spend even more time than our, our subcommittees allowed for to, to really talk about those details. And the programming subcommittee, in a way, it sort of served a different role, I think, from what we originally intended, the, the, the programming subcommittee. But the Innovation Journal Club really picked up in those areas where we had wanted to address certain topics, um, but didn't quite get around to. So it was, it was really, really good for um, keeping us on track for, the, for what we really wanted the Innovation Lab to be. Um, and it, you know, something that, that might not be too obvious to the others here, even in this group, is that it really got us additional buy-in with our steering committee and our academic peers. I mean, it, this is something that we've been able to talk about. Um, as, if there's been any concern about like, well, what's the pro how's the progress going? Or what, is it, how, what does this mean to me? We can talk about how Innovation Journal Club has launched different types of discussions that, that, uh, that really give us a deeper look at how the academic community fits in, how the, the external community, there, there seems to be a lot of problems with the, how we can define those, uh, those communities and an innovation journal club helps us define that. So after opening, uh, what, we were struggling a little bit with the attendance in the innovation journal club, but after the opening, uh, we know that that's gonna expand quite a bit because we'll have uh, uh, a bigger draw to the innovation lab, we'll have more people coming in, we'll have more formal lines drawn with faculty and staff who are involved with the uh, activities and who are gonna be assessing data. So we expect a much larger turnout with Innovation uh, Journal Club. And there've been some really great formative moments. Um, I absolutely love that we've uh, addressed the maker competencies and that we've partnered with other institutions and how that's influenced our development. Um, I'm, I'm happy to see Emily involved regarding scholarly communications and copyright. And we've had some terrific discussions on diversity, equity, and inclusion, and what that means to us, how we can explore options for reaching out to many different demographics. I'm curious what some of the others here might have to say about some of their more favorite moments. Uh, I see that we have the different topics up there. Do any of you want to share uh, some of the moments that you've particularly uh, appreciated in Innovation Journal Club? I really like talking about um, like nerding out on metrics and assessment, but I say like there's no specific thing that I've enjoyed most about Journal Club. I'm just really surprised that people from my department keep coming back and, and talking to us about this thing that that is maybe intimidating or, or new or um, we don't have time for. We make time for it because it's exciting. Um, so yeah, metrics and assessment and specifically like how we're going to assess the, the diversity, inclusion, and equity is something that I think we've gotten a lot out of. There's research out there on that, and there's research not related to journal, I mean, not related to innovation spaces um, that we can look at. And, and we've um, really, the the book, um, Remaking the Library Makerspace that just came out has, uh, we want to do a journal club on every chapter of it. It's great. I mean, I'll, I'll talk about intellectual property all day, um, but I think I think the thing that was is there was a there was a space for me to take um, a role in the innovation lab that wasn't it was a bite. Um, I can bring up these topics. There was a venue for me to nerd out on my area of interest and my technical specialty. 
um, and assess needs and anticipate those needs. Um, unfortunately, in a pandemic online environment, but the blessing in that is like I can anticipate those needs now beforehand. I um, mean, there weren't just questions generated in my head; it was buy-in from from my colleagues. Um, so the ability to be able to take a bite out of the space and see where I can help without needing a larger role or time commitment there, I think was really great. The ability to engage with peers on topics that interest me. Um, but I think also working on establishing a culture. I think the unfortunate beauty of a new, brand new library with a brand new space um, is that that building that culture can look a little bit differently. And um, the literature we've read on that um, brings out a lot of opinions in every member of the panel. And I think those are all really valid and I think are really helping us um, look for, for new articles to consider and topics to talk about, um, but also to help us make the healthiest, most effective, diverse space possible. And I'm gonna jump in and say, as somebody on the technology side of it, I have really appreciated seeing the perspective of other people and their interest areas and the connections that they can help us make in the lab, because that's one of the things that we really want to, want to be able to do is to make those connections between the needs and the experts who can help fill those needs. So it's been really nice to be able to, to get to know some of those experts better and to just hear different perspectives from a non-technical point of view. So um, we would love to stand for questions. And if you have about any of the topics we've covered or the mechanics of how we've put this um, community together and, and how, how we use Teams or any anything is open um, for discussion here. Scott, I missed the keynote, but that sounds really important. The diverse perspectives was key and it was in the keynote today. So I'll ramble a little bit now since we have some some silence while we're waiting for questions um, and say that one of the things that I think is really neat about having a journal club, in addition to having all those um, the structured organizations, that the journal club can really go off in weird places and wacky ideas and have really big conversations about really important things that might not be the nuts and bolts of getting the space up and running. So the operations and the buying the equipment and knowing how to use the technology and doing all the deal making that comes with ordering technology is not in my wheelhouse at all, but thinking about how it's going to be used and who's going to use it and how we're going to make them like it and help them find what they need and, and, and the skills they need in the space and how we're going to build that community. There, there are just so many great conversations we've had in the journal club that couldn't happen in the other committees because they were tasked with specific things that weren't dream or go find research and think about how we can implement things or how we can make things better, how we can use the best practices or how we can learn from others. So that's been um, one of my my favorite things about being on both the coordinating committee and the programming committee and in the journal club is just how those ideas go from one place to another, like we'll come up with a small idea in passing in the programming committee. And then we might be able to find an article that's related and have like a bigger conversation with different people. And the different people involved in the different conversations really does bring, um, bring a lot of richness to the, the planning process. I guess I'll just say, I think in terms of culture coming out of the Innovation Journal Club is one thing, but I think the culture it's helped to build and the relationships, at least as a new person to the libraries, um, has been hugely significant. It's something I look forward to every month um, because I, we, we do get off topic. We do extend the topic much farther, um, but you, you learn. I didn't know some of my colleagues were interested in digital humanities and what they've done in the past. I didn't know some of my colleagues are tinkerers who do amazing things and fix things um, and have opinions on the right to repair. Um, so the community that it's offered um, when structured and even though it's unstructured tangents has been so incredibly valuable. Um, 
I, I truly look forward to the club. Um, and even if there are articles I, I don't understand the technology behind or I'm more distant from um, the ability to know that I'm not the only person in the room feeling that um, and still get a huge learning experience out of it has been so incredibly valuable. I'm glad you mentioned right to repair. That's a, a very good example. That, that's something that's uh, been near and dear. I know it's a very big issue out in this region of the United States. Uh, and, and we've talked about it in the programming subcommittee. Uh, we've talked about it, I think, also in our coordinating committee. Um, but it's not something that we've ever, we have so much going on in these, these subcommittees that we really haven't had the time to look at, at topics like that in detail. And, and Innovation Journal Club has just been such a great, great resource for saying, okay, we want to talk about this very big thing. We want to dedicate this time to it. We want to have the chat history of that. We want to have uh, be able to make this available to people both who can attend at the time as well as maybe who maybe they weren't attend but they want to be a part of that discussion and and can go in and, and, and make comments. Like using Teams has been really great for that. Um, people just go in and, and get into the channel, um, post different things, maybe some uh, links that are of interest. So that it's sort of a living body of knowledge that we, we can either look back to or build upon later. So we have a question from Scott Finkeldye. Um, is the Journal Club creating culture with the people who are joining? People who don't know what the lab is, are they becoming the culture? Um, so the Journal Club is open. To we have a meeting, we kind of try to advertise it to the whole library and remind everyone on the coordinating committee it's happening. Um, because it's in teams, we've invited a lot of people. So our guests from ag education, they're still in there so they can still lurk on, on whatever it is that's coming up and what we're talking about. Um, but the, the discussion that we had on establishing culture was about establishing culture in the space. And so that was uh, been an interesting, like maybe we'll have an impact on how we train our student workers and how staff approaches new, like, you can always tell when somebody's never been in a space before. And so like, how do we make sure that those people get um, the attention that they need and, and not be overwhelmed by this is way too much. I'm thinking like when I go into a bike shop um, before I became a bike mechanic, I would go into a bike shop and somebody would tell me a bunch of things that were wrong with my bike and use all sorts of vocabulary I didn't know. And it would just be head and I would be overwhelmed. And so we don't want that at all. And so the culture that we're trying to, that we talked about establishing was a culture where everyone is a maker and when, where you come in the door and you, you have something to explore. And so providing a space and making it a, an open space for don't know that. And it's really just that we want to make this a welcoming space everybody. We don't want anyone to feel like they don't belong, whether they've ever made things before, whether they think they're not techie, you know, not all making is techie and um, everybody can do, but sometimes it takes different ways to show people what they can do. And, and we need to find those interest areas for them and, and give them an easy project to start so that they get excited about it. So with the people who are joining the Journal Club, like our, our colleague Ellen, who, who joined the programming committee as a result of being in the Journal Club conversations, um, they're like people come with different experiences. And so I think the, the culture within the Journal Club is really like anyone can come and anyone who has an idea or who wants to do research is welcome to, to bring an article. Um, people usually don't approach me with articles. So I will go and look up articles that I think will fit the people that are coming to the club regularly and invite them to, to Renee, you haven't been pegged yet. So <laughs> watch out. Um, so, so people who come regularly will, um, can, can step up and host an article, hosting an article, culture of art, reading the article, reading the article kind of prompt for people to think about as they're reading the article so that they have a conversation, we'll have something to talk about. Um, so far, all of the conversations we've had have been incredibly rich and useful. And I think people can come to the club without reading the article. I have a friend who hosted an, um, an unbook club or unreading book club where they talked about books that they hadn't read. <laughs> um, 
And so the the person hosting it read the book and then talked about it. So people might not have time and maybe that's why they're not coming. Um, we try to make the space, the actual journal club space welcoming. And when we open the, the lab, we might even advertise that we have a journal club because I think students who are interested in making or interested in um, working in spaces like that would be interested also in, and, and faculty too, whoever the lab, which is open to anyone on campus or off campus, might be interested in joining us in these conversations about how we can use what others have done to improve the space that we have. I, I really think we need to, and I, I think I kind of uh, might have even committed to that some in some of the comments I was saying. The, the, to pick on uh, Ellen, she I think she described herself as a technophobe, and I can't say enough how valuable it's been to have that perspective. Somebody who who had said she wasn't even sure whether she wanted to walk to the lab that we have. Uh, like, what, what does the innovation lab mean to her? What is, she, what is all this technology going to, like, can she get in there? Can she walk in there? Can she, can she start using things immediately? Um, can she overcome certain sorts of boundaries uh, and hesitations? And this is a big part of the, the audience that we're going to be working with. And had she not stepped into that, I mean, a lot of us work with technology fine, but having her perspective in there has been amazing. And having the, the journal club potentially opened up to many other perspectives, I mean, that that's really what will help us develop, I think, as a, a place that can meet all sorts of different users, all sorts of different needs. Um, and introducing people to things that they may never have uh, considered otherwise. So I, the, the great thing is that, fantastic. I'm sorry, go ahead. All right. No, that's okay. The great thing is that Ellen's been willing to talk to us about it because a lot of people who are in that situation aren't willing to say, I don't get it or I'm afraid to try this. So it's been really great to hear that perspective because we're not going to hear it from a lot of the people who feel that way. So it gives us great insight and hopefully we can find ways to reach those that aren't as vocal. And then it also makes the best champ because she's not knowing anything and she's now like she's used a 360 camera she's put on a VR headset like she she has been really involved in how we're doing outreach us come up with a mission and vi vision and values that that will connect with people who who find the space or see that so the journal club is kind of uh, making bridges like we're we're just one club we have about eight people who come regularly and other people who join us um, but they're one of those people knows other people every time we have a conversation we all grow our knowledge of what what is happening and and our perspective of what could happen because what we're talking about is really exploring things that we don't have and so everything we we think about is kind of a, a future or a, a dream or a, an idea that that is very nascent but like the way that we were able to make connections with our community and communicate what is happening even though we sometimes don't know what's happening um if you come tomorrow morning you'll learn a lot about how how the the organization has changed over time and how we've done the planning and how the planning has changed because of the fire and because of COVID. And that's just like a lot of, a lot of unknowns and a lot of we resets or a lot of, uh, we have to rethink the way we're doing this because supply chain is broken or things like that, that we, the communication piece, um, I think is really grown from the journal club, like the ability to communicate what this is and, and how to be comfortable with all the unknowns, um, which is a big part of innovating. So I think it's cool that we're we're able to kind of have this space where we prototype um, ideas without the technology. And then once we get the technology, we'll feel a lot more comfortable. We'll actually have our journal club meetings in the space and we might have them around specific technologies and, and maybe it won't be a journal club anymore. Maybe it'll just be a maker club or something. So we'll see. I want to talk to records and archives. I'd love to find a way to preserve that channel. As a humanist who had a traditional humanist upbringing and didn't know digital humanities until I went to library school and then was just overwhelmed. I think that that's kind of what the Journal Club captures. It's like there's an overwhelming amount of possibilities with these tools. Um, and my input in this is technical because I'm comfortable there, but the reality is 
there are so many great partnerships and students reaching out and asking questions who are in the same place where it's like, there's so much potential. What could I 3D print for my history project? What could I map in ancient Rome with this technology? Um, and it's an overabundance of eagerness and interest and then shock and terror because how do I channel this? Um, and in the best way, I think the Journal Club captures that too and resolves that in a really nice way. It is, we're all coming in with different interests. We're all really eager. We're all really nervous. We're all really excited. Everything's changing. And it's not like a, we could come in one and done and have our problems resolved and our end goal and our end project right there. Um, we all went through the same thing. It's a very kind of maker process. And I think that the Journal Club captures that well. Interdisciplinary interest, multiple viewpoints, changes in direction, um, but a really fantastic kind of beautiful end product that, that does meet a need um, that a lot of times is unspoken. Um, so it's 1130. Thank you so much for joining us in this conversation. Um, we didn't share our contact information, but we all work at K-State Libraries. So um, I, yeah, we can type our names in the chat and then I'll put the contact link. Um, but yeah, please come to our session tomorrow if you're interested in learning more about the space. Whoa, somebody just asked in the event chat who remembers the movie they saw in a theater. I don't. <laughs> Thank you, Corey and Matt. Thanks for hosting us. Thank you. Thanks to everybody as well as uh, in this group. I uh, appreciate the comments people made. There, there's some really, really good things to that. Uh, even if you're feeling it inside, you can't quite verbalize it. And Emily, I really appreciate the comments you said at the end. I really think drove home the, the essence of what we've been striving for. That's great. So I just put me to shame. I realized like I don't have any technical knowledge of these tools other than sheer nerdiness and interest in their IP. Like if you're like 3D print something today. If it's not a thing of first drag and drop, I will not be able to help anyone, but it doesn't mean I don't have ideas and I'm super excited and want to learn. <laughs> it's a very real reflection. Like I probably sound like I know more than I do and I do not. No, no. <laughs> Google search is an amazing thing. There are yeah. files out there for everything, <laughs> almost everything. I had a little hard time with a Fort Hayes graduation gift this weekend, but. I managed to come up with something. So, <laughs> like, I mean, I saw the post about the Liquid Galaxy. I didn't get a chance to respond. Like, I want training so badly, and yet I'm so scared. Like, members of the Journal Club, scared too, but so excited. <laughs> well, see, and so to the people we have remaining in the room, uh, the, the attendees, uh, and you can see that even we have to struggle through some of that ourselves. But yeah, we're, we're there for each other, and Journal Club is definitely you know, bringing us there. Yeah. All right. Um, I, I, we're recording and we still have people. Maybe we should sign off then and, and uh, hopefully people can join us tomorrow morning at nine o'clock. Yeah, good luck. Uh, I'll, I'll right. sign in. <laughs> See awesome. y'all. Take Thanks. care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.